Okay. It looks like we are live. How is everyone today? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and for today's live stream, I'm going to be talking about how to use the selective color curves in the Lumetri color panel, which you'll find in both uh, After Effects and Premiere Pro. And as I've talked about before on stream, what's awesome about having this in both applications is first and foremost, it's very easy to have color consistency uh, when working between the apps, especially if you're using things like Dynamic Link, which allow you to bring After Effects comps into Premiere and Premiere sequences into After Effects. But also with these new selective color curves, um, even if you're starting out with color and you're new to sort of working with color and curves in general, once you understand the fundamentals, it's so easy um, to achieve a particular look and to control specific selective colors inside of your video, inside of an image. It'll just open up a whole new world of possibilities for you when working with color on your content. <coughs> oh. <coughs> Excuse me. Swallowed incorrectly there. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, as always, for joining us on stream. Uh, <coughs> oh, my God. Coming to us on uh, Twitter, Periscope, YouTube, and Behance. We had a Facebook uh, wasn't wasn't allowing me to stream, so no Facebook today. Sorry about that. But uh, we'll catch you on the next one. So as always, thank you so much for joining. Scotty Leah, Alan Jennings, Desiree, Steph S, and other friends. Hello, Roberto. All right, very nice to see you all. M. Erickson. All right, so let's just go ahead and jump right in. We're going to start... Actually, we're going to work on this today in After Effects. Typically, I've shown this um, in Premiere, but again, the benefits here are that it works the same in both applications. All right. So we're going to first go over, uh, we're going to focus on four of the particular selective color curve modules. There are actually five in total, and uh, they are as follows. So you have hue versus sat, hue versus hue, hue versus luma, and Luma versus Sat. So these are the four that we're going to cover. There's also Sat versus Sat. This one is a bit more broadcast specific and very difficult. And it's to, to sort of understand, frankly, even for me. And uh, this is probably the one that you'll use the least. So I believe I covered this in one of the other training vids, but we're just gonna focus on these four because these are really the fundamental ones that'll significantly change the way you work with color inside of these two applications. Okay. So here we have um, a video. This was shot by uh, some of our friends at Silber Salts in Germany. And uh, beautiful shot here. Love, love the, the color and the saturation. And uh, as we were looking at this, the client was saying, well, you know, I love this, but it would be nice. It, it, it's sort of, it's sort, of, sort of one tone. It was actually shot, I think, around golden hour. So we got this kind of nice warmth to it, but nothing's really popping out of the image. So they thought, and this is something which I get a lot, you know, what if you could sort of bring out like just the vibrance, the, the, the color of the lips a bit more, and then maybe warm up the skin tone and perhaps saturate the sky a little bit more. All right, so three, three very specific tasks here. Okay, so for all of this, you can use hue versus sat. And the way to understand how these filters work, how these uh, color correction curves work, is it means you're adjusting the saturation of a particular hue. And in the case of hue versus hue, you're adjusting the actual hue of an existing hue. Hue versus luma, you're adjusting the luminance of a particular hue. You get the idea. So once you kind of just even understand what these mean, you can kind of grok how to use them. So we're going to start by making a selection with the familiar Adobe eyedropper. So we'll come up to hue versus hue, uh, hue versus sat, grab the eyedropper up here, and I'm simply going to click on her lips right here. And when I do that, you're going to be presented with three little control points. Now I talked about this even the other day on stream. This is how you would typically affect that range of red in most grading applications. What our engineers have done, which I think is really beneficial, especially to the color noob, is you have a slider here, which is now just going to pull that color range directly in view. It just it just makes it easier to edit and to manipulate. So I this is just so, so valuable and so cool. All right, so once we have this, I can simply drag this control point up or down to saturate that hue or desaturate. And you'll actually see on the hue line itself, it gives you, as you go above the line, it's 
more red, and as you go below the line, it, it segues to sort of white, all right, black and white in that case. Now, if you hold down the shift key, it will constrain that vertical motion so that you're not moving hue left or right, right? As you get further to the left, you'll be going more into the magentas and blues. As you go further to the right, you'll be getting more into the oranges and the warm tones there. We don't want that. We want this specific tone. So I'm going to hold down the shift key and I'm going to start raising. And as I mentioned, you can see that as I go above the line here, right, we're saturating and below the line desaturating, okay? And you can see that it's starting to bring out the red in the lips, but of course it's also affecting some of the rosiness in her cheeks. Okay, well, we can combat that. We can fix that simply by going to this control point here and moving this a bit more in uh, to the left like this. So you can see now we're solely focusing on lips here. In fact, if I just zoom in a little bit, I'll be able to see this even better, okay? And if I turn this off and turn it back on, now you can very vividly see it's really only affecting uh, the color of the lipstick here as opposed to the, the her cheeks and kind of the warmth uh, in her cheeks there. Really simple, really cool, super easy to use, and a quick, quick fix just like that, okay? Now, as mentioned, we also wanted to do maybe a little additional warmth of the skin tone and then uh, saturation in the sky. The blue sky there, it's a, it's a little flat, it's a little gray. So you can have multiple points happening simultaneously in a single hue versus sat curve. Once again, we'll take our eyedropper and I'm going to click on kind of what I would consider to be sort of the most, I don't say neutral skin tone, but sort of representative of overall skin tone hue, which is going to be in her forehead here. And again, we're presented with additional control points. Same thing. Now I can just drag this and I can start to saturate just like that, you know, ever so subtly. Again, maybe we'll move this in just a bit so it's not affecting some of the adjacent hues. All right, and very quickly before and after. You know, we're making kind of subtle changes here, but just enough to bring out a little bit more pop in this shot. And lastly, let's go over to the sky. I'm gonna take a sample in the upper right-hand corner here of that blue. You can see that it moves over to here. Again, I can drag this into view into the center. In this case, I will hold down the shift once again, and now we can just begin to saturate that blue ever so subtly, all right? Something like that. So overall, before, a little bit flatter, still beautiful, but just a little bit flatter. After, a little bit more of a pop. Okay, maybe we'll even bring down the skin tone saturation here just a little bit, all right? And play through this and it just looks lovely, all right? And again, because you have uninterrupted preview in After Effects, we can disable the effect. So here's the before, and here's the after, all right? And that little subtle difference just kind of makes her, first of all, you focus more on the center of this image here, and it just, it just really looks lovely. It just pops right out that sky, and you can see that that sky also affected some of the hues of the water down below ever so subtly. Down here, this was looking a little, little sort of grayish green. Now when we turn this on, it's just decidedly more kind of aqua blue, really nice, and it's just a really easy way to tackle specific colors in your shot, okay? So that's hue versus sat. All right. Uh, I had another um, variation of this one here, which I think is kind of cool too, because this was all saturating. This was uh, yet another shot here where um, the director was saying they loved the, uh, this shot, so cool, uh, done in Africa. But um, this green tarp, it's, it's very visually distracting because all the other background elements are, again, kind of neutral tone and flat. So in this case, what we wanted to do was kind of neutralize that green, kind of just desaturate so that it kind of falls in the background a bit more so that, again, that image in the center of the girls dancing just really draws your eye. Right now, I find myself looking off to the right here. So same thing, I'll take the eyedropper, I'll take a sample of this, pulls up our control points, and just like that, I can desaturate that green and really almost match it to the adjacent hues back here, all right? Now you can even see up here, in the, in the highlights, kind of missing a little bit of that. So maybe we expand the range ever so slightly to bring some more of that in. We could also take an additional sample if we wanted. But now when you take a look, 
right? Now our eyes stay focused because we don't have that very distracting, very bright green tarp. Let's turn it off. And you can see before it was just, it was too vibrant for this shot. You're, you're kind of losing the point here. Kick it back in and it's lovely, all right? Sort of homogenize the overall look of the background there and keeps the focus on our dancers in the foreground. Really, really cool stuff. All right, Hue versus Sat. Okay, so with this same, this is an alternate uh, shot of this same group. Here's what we want to do now. So now we're going to use um, Hue versus Hue. And as mentioned, this one allows you to adjust the hue of an existing hue in your shot. So why would you do that? Well, in the case of this, the director was looking and he thought, yeah, you know, what would be kind of cool is if we could take all the, all the girls dancing here, have their dresses match the sort of magenta color of these girls along the side here, all right? Just as an example, you're gonna see what happens when you choose hue versus hue, because not unlike hue versus sat, when you saw that vertical line represented saturation, desaturation at the top and bottom of the, of the graph there, well now you're going to get a hue spectrum from top to bottom when we make our selection. So let's go ahead and do that. So we take our eyedropper here and just kind of find a representative red right there, orange red, just like that, okay? Here we go, I'm gonna hold down my shift, constrain that point as well. And now what you will see is that we have now a full spectrum of hues, which means that if we go south of this, we can turn it orange, green, yellow, etc. And as we go north of this, we can find that magenta to match our friends on the left side of the frame. Now, not unlike what was happening before with the lips and skin tone, you can see that we're starting to affect some of the skin tones here as well. So in this case, I'm going to take this leftmost point and move this one in towards our main control point there, like that, just to really uh, confine what's happening there. All right, like that. That looks to be pretty good. Okay, again, before, after, awesome. Play it back, and just like that, we've homogenized the color. You'd never know. You'd never know that it was any other. It was any other hue, right? Before, after. So cool. Something worth dancing over, right? Really, really neat. So hue versus hue. Again, one of those things where I thought before, why? How is this possible? You see this so often. A lot of times, you know, think about it. You shoot something. Someone's wearing, you know, these these glasses have actually a blue a blue hue inside of them, which matches kind of the blue that's projecting here. Maybe I want to change this red to make it pop out. How would you otherwise do that? Well, there's like select color, change color. Some of these effects aren't 32 bit, so then you're messing with 8 bit and 32 bit color effects. This is all 32 bit. It's simple, it's an eyedropper, and it just works. It works as you expect, as long as you just understand what the terminology means. Real simply, all right? Adjusting the hue of a particular hue. Okay, so that's hue versus hue. All right, let's move on to hue versus luma. So again, this one means we're going to adjust the luminance of a particular hue, right? Effectively, our, our, our brightness, the bright and dark, the light and dark. So in this particular shot, this one I believe was done in Finland, uh, also by Sibler Salts. Beautiful shot here, love this. Uh, and I, th I hope, that I'm forgetting now, was this Finland? I think so. Um, but the sky just, it's, it's a little, it's not that it's flat, but it needs a little more drama. We need to kind of darken those blue hues, that blue in the sky. You know, you can see a lot of the foreground elements. I know it's a bit more contrasty over the stream, but we want to add a little bit more drama to that sky. And to do that, we're simply going to adjust the luminance of the blue range, okay? So once again, let's just scroll down here. We'll go to Hue versus Luma. Take the eyedropper. Let's get a sample of that blue, all right? And now, again, I just love the way that this was visually designed because when I click on the control point, you'll see that as we move in an upward motion, that's, that's adding brightness, adding luminance, right? So we're kind of washing it out, but we don't want that. We want to darken that, right? So as you go below the line here, you can see it fades all the way into almost black. So this is just going to add a subtle little amount of drama. Again, we can go really extreme here, 
or just a little bit, just like that, all right? Just to add a little bit of drama there, wind it back, hit play. So here's our before, right? Nice, but again, not quite as dramatic. And after, just adds that subtle little bit of drama. And then of course, if we wanted to, we could also come up further and maybe adjust the saturation of those blues as well. You know, so now you've got this really rich, dark blue, right? Uh, something like that. And now, you know, now this is starting to really, really come together. And maybe we also want to add some saturation to, uh, to the earth, to the mountains back over here, right? A little something like this. Okay, I'm kind of going a little, a little overboard here. But you get the idea, all right? And again, we can always disable. You can see the before and the after. Just some kind of subtle, subtle adjustments there, but just kind of making the overall shot pop even a little bit more, all right? So that's hue versus luma with a little added hue versus sat. Okay, and for my last number, <laughs> for the last one, I've got two examples here. Now this was one that kind of, uh, kind of frightened me in the <laughs> from the beginning because I thought, okay, do I under even, even understand what this is supposed to do? So that's luma versus sat. So we want to adjust the saturation value of a particular luminance value. And as you can probably guess, in this case, what we want to do is you've got this very, very bright, very overblown bright sun. But in fact, when they were there shooting this, it was very warm. There was this beautiful, warm sort of yellow glow. But the capture, it just it just kind of came out sort of blown out, right? It's just not, it doesn't look super dramatic here. So we want to adjust the saturation of that very sunny, bright area. Okay, so we'll take a sample here, come up to this, and I'm just going to start raising this. And just like that, you can now see how we're adding some beautiful saturation to that bright white area. And if I globally raise the curve here, right, you can see that I'm also increasing the saturation of the darker areas, including that sort of ground, that foreground. So again, here's our before, kind of blown out and, and just flat in terms of color. Here's the after, and now it has, it has a feel, it has a vibe. It's got some beautiful vibrance going on there, and this just looks wonderful, okay? Really, really cool. Again, before, kind of flat, after, adding back in some of that midday warm sun. You still have kind of that very kind of blown out orb, although there's quite a bit of detail in the clouds. And again, if we were to come up to something like our basic corrections here, we could probably even tone down some of the highlights as well, which is just also going to increase a bit more of that saturation. Now you're, the, the ridges of the mountain are really popping. You're seeing more cloud detail and the shot is really nicely coming together. All right, and of course you could uh, enable or disable these modules to see how they all work together, okay? Now one more quick example of this. This is another one where in this case, um, kind of a similar issue where we have this, this blue sky, which you know on site appeared to be very, very vibrant and blue, but in this case, it's the brightness is kind of, it, it just feels, well, just too white, too overblown. So we want to do the same thing. So I took my sample, all right? We have my selection here. Oh, whoops, I already made it. Come up and grab my control point and just add a little bit of saturation to that bright area there, all right? Before, after, and you can see it I even adds some nice saturation to the highlights along the edges of the shot there, before, after, all right? With just one subtle adjustment. Now you might say, could you also do a hue versus sat or why not just do a hue versus sat? Well, because then again, you still, in fact, one of the things I might've done here too, would be to use hue versus luma to maybe drop some of the brightness as well and leverage that as a way to add a little bit more drama in the blues themselves, right? Maybe something a bit like this, okay? 
just to kind of darken those blues a bit. Now this is a this is a proxy, so that's why you're seeing some of the uh, the pixelation there. All right. Again, we could do the same by kind of blowing it back out again. But again, different techniques for different styles of, of exactly what you're trying to tame here. Again, if we were trying to say, use uh, uh, Luma versus Sat in this case, which was great, but now we're still having a little bit, maybe the, the, the brights are a little too over bright. You could come in here and maybe adjust those highlights ever so slightly, okay? Now, in this case, we'd probably want to expand the range there because we're losing a little bit of that selection. So you can see, if you look in the upper corner right here, right? Because again, that brightness, it's its a gradient scale. So I wasn't quite getting it. Now I could take another sample, but simply by adjusting this control point outward, now you can see I've unified um, the selection right there. So you don't have that weird sort of grayish hole in the corner, all right? So before, after, before, after, okay? And that's Luma versus Sat. And that, my friends, is using selective color in After Effects and Premiere. Oh, and it's worth pointing out, by the way, that all of this was actually dynamically linked from a Premiere Pro project. So if I were to go back over to Premiere, which you didn't even see, you may have just noticed that the screen just kind of popped because, yes, I'd applied that curve to, uh, uh, to this particular clip here. So let's say if I were to come back to After Effects, and let's go to our, uh, oh, it was this one here at the beginning of the shot, right? Let's come over back to this, and let's go ahead and let's disable Luma versus Sat here. All right, so it's flat again. Click back over to Premiere, it's flat again, right? Didn't even have to save, because that's dynamic link. Turn it back on, resaturated, back over to Premiere, resaturated, okay? So all of these were actually dynamically linked into After Effects. But of course you could have done this natively in Premiere Pro as well. I just like to point out that the same thing is in both apps, okay? All right, well, let's go ahead and uh, pop over to the chats and see if we have any questions. And if not, I will let you go and let you enjoy the rest of your day. Steph S, we enjoy every day. Great to see you. <laughs> FB, I know. Danielle Poletto, how are you? Ciao, my friend. Long time. Ajit, hello. Steph, you've been learning how to use Spark AR Studio. Oh, awesome. Spark is so great. Uh, one of these days, you know, my colleague Terry's done a bunch of streams on Spark. I should do a Spark stream. For those of you unfamiliar, Adobe Spark, it's a free app available to you as a CC customer as well. And you, I think it's even free outside of CC. Uh, just a great way to create momentary, cool, quick social media posts. There's Spark video as well. You can do so many things with it. It's got beautiful text, beautiful templates. Um, and Spark AR Studio was super cool too. All right. Um, let's see here. Uh, any way of using the eyedropper to grab the target hue, magenta in this case, or does the dropper only get used when selecting which hue to change? Yeah, so that's that's the idea is, um, yes, it's using when you're in hue versus hue, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about changing the girl's uh, outfits there. Yes, it's selecting the color that you're trying to, uh, trying to, to affect, trying to change, as opposed to a match to color, right? Now, if you wanted to do a match to, there's other ways to do that, but that's not how hue versus hue works. So yeah, it's it's you're grabbing the target of what you're ultimately trying to change, and then I was just kind of eyeballing it to to make them the same. All right, Wesley Jones, you've often wondered how these controls work. Now you know. Awesome. Yes, right. <clears throat> Power. It's so easy. And I'm telling you, when we first developed these, and I first saw them, and it was before they kind of the UI and everything was finished. I I was completely completely intimidated in trying to use these things. I just thought this is never going to happen. It's way too, way too above my head. But uh, now it all makes sense. Aid Cochran, is it just my monitor or your color is oversaturated right now, especially reds? Yeah, so, you know, streaming, you're going to get some oversaturation. And I'm also overdoing it a little so that you can get the idea. But yeah, it's, it's, it could be, it's, combination of your your monitor perhaps and just you know streaming colors also reds in particular some of these reds um, streaming software doesn't like them so you'll get this weird noisy green artifacting so sorry for that aid um, I was indeed oversaturating a bit just to kind of prove the point 
Vince Schilling, I didn't even know there was grass there until you boosted the saturation. Nice adjustment. Yes, I mean, that's it, right? And sometimes just making those adjustments with things like Luma versus Sat, it just, it just opens up something in the shot where, because your eye was so focused on that overblown sky, you never saw what was happening in the foreground of the shot at all. So you can kind of neutralize and equalize the color to kind of bring you back in so that you're really kind of experiencing the entire widescreen scene. Great to see you, Vince, by the way. So nice. Um, okay, and then Peter White is asking, can you match shot in sat versus sat? So not specifically, but again, if you had a look, and here, I'll just click back for just a second. Um, if you had, let's say, uh, I mean, this one's a, a something like this, you know, and you wanted to do a shot match with something like this, you know, to kind of, again, align the hues and the brightness, um, you wouldn't do it in curves. For that, you would go into the color wheel section, and here is where uh, you'll be able to um, do a shot match. But it appears, <laughs> didn't even realize that, um, color wheels and match, that's actually on the Premiere Pro side. So if we were to come back over to Premiere here and go into color wheels and match, here's where you have your shot matching, okay? And I think the reason for that is because we've got the comparison view. Oh, I didn't even switch over my screen, sorry. Uh, we have the comparison view um, in Premiere Pro. So again, if you were trying to match this, you know, against this or something like that, you could go into comparison view and you could scrub ahead. All right, I mean, these are already pretty close, but I could say, okay, so match this to this, and it even tells you, here's the reference, here's the current frame. We're not trying to detect faces here, and then apply the match, and you can see it It made, you know, it's, it's adjusting various parameters. It looks like it did a, a couple of contrast adjustments, which is actually pretty good. Um, this is all fully editable. So again, um, oh yeah, it, it drastically reduced the highlight contrast there, again, because there was so much over bright and you don't have any of that here. You got great cloud detail. But this is a really quick way to do that. And then of course you also have your side-by-sides. So, you know, if we're comparing some of the blues, actually the mid-tones look a bit more magenta-y. So I might try and cool some of these off like this. All right. Now that looks a little bit closer. I can also use the horizontal. And sometimes I love doing this because this is where you get the horizons and you're like, oh yeah, those clouds totally look like they could match, like they're kind of in the same scene. Again, we've now cooled off that shot along the bottom. And this is just a good way to know if you're kind of in the same range. You can also disable, so here's the before, decidedly different, right? And here's the matched after, and you're like, oh yeah. The contrast, I mean, look at, you know, I always say like, look at these clouds right here and then look at these clouds, right? It's, it's that highlight contrast adjustment that really kind of brought those two in together. And it's a great way to A, B those looks. So that's how you'd perform that match, Peter, if you wanted to do the shot match. But unfortunately, um, in this case, uh, it's on the premiere side, not on the After Effects side. All right. Cools. All right. A couple more questions here. All right, um, Vince, again, can you selectively adjust part of the frame? Uh, so, you know, if that, I've actually gotten asked that before. So if you're wanting to do that, the answer is yes, you can. How you would do that though, is by using um, a mask. And again, this is really, it's easier to do on the Premiere side. So if you were trying to, um, adjust the hue of something without affecting a similar color elsewhere in the frame, uh, what you could do, let me switch back over one more time. Whoops, sorry, hold on. What you could do is go back to, get out of this comparison view. All right, so, Inside of, with every effect, and you could do this in After Effects as well, but it's just, it's right here and so easy inside of Premiere. Um, you have these various masking controls. So what these will allow you to do is to affect a specific masked range of a shot. 
So like if I wanted to apply this Lumetri and all of its modules only to a particular section, uh, I can use an elliptical four point polygon or a free draw bezier. So let's say, you know, I wanted to do something like, you know, just in this range here. All right, <laughs> just for giggles. Okay, I'm just gonna select this, this part of his cheek right here. Now, because of that mask, um, you'll notice that I can adjust the tint and it's only affecting everything that's in that mask. By the way, here's another example. I'm going extreme to show you that it's only affecting the selected range. Of course, you can expand the mask. You can do whatever, you can feather it. Uh, so, you know, it kind of bleeds into the surrounding ranges like that, which again, makes it a bit more subtle. Uh, and similarly, you know, if we were coming to our selective curves here, right? And we wanted to affect the saturation of this, you know, like that. Now it's only affecting that range, right? But we have it significantly feathered there. So that's how you would do that, right? Just using masking, which is really effective. You could also, in theory, if you're looking to color correct a very specific range of color as well, you could use HSL secondaries. But this is really the easiest way because the mask ensures that it's really specific to that part of the shot, you know? There might be other skin tone ranges over here, we're not affecting those. It's only going to affect the masked area. All right, great question, Vince, love that. Okay. Super cool. Uh, Steph, cool, Aid, cool, Vince. I have one of the most gorgeous live streams on YouTube. Ah, well, thank you very much, Vince. Ever posted or thought of doing a tutorial on the live stream? Yeah, you know, I ask, uh, I, I get asked this a lot to like just talk about the setup. I mean, it's a lot of stuff involved. You can kind of see, I mean, well, you can't really tell. Of course, you know, you can sort of see a lot of the gear and stuff that's involved. So, you know, first of all, these Kino flows are what's driving me. Uh, and I have them, of course, softened here. So you're getting a nice soft light on me. There's also gradient ambient lights all throughout. I'm being lit from above. There's a fill in the back. So, you know, 90% of it is, is lighting. Um, and positioning, and then of course, just shooting through um, a really lovely uh, Nikkor 24 to 70 f2.8 lens. Um, just gives it kind of that that nice look. But thank you very much. I really I do appreciate that. I didn't want it to look good for y'all, you know. All right. Let's see if we've got any things coming up on Periscope. All for truth. It's your first day on Periscope. Welcome, H Learning. All right. JD Timothy, Nicolina, The Real Con, hello. Yep, that's it. Thanks, Jace. Very nice, Peter. Okay. Every we okay, yep. Yeah. Masks. Uh, is it easier to animate the masks in AE or PR when doing this? Um same. I would say that the masking tracking, you have a little more control. You have more control on the After Effects side. And here I can show you that just one more time uh, on where Premiere is concerned. I don't know how this is going to track specifically. This is this will be interesting because um, of how my mask is drawn. But let's say I want to track his. Yes, I don't really have. I'm not. I'm not fixed. This is going to be a weird track. I'm not even sure if this is going to track very well at all. This is kind of a bad example for that. But in terms of ease. You know, in Premiere, uh, it's as simple as creating that mask and then clicking this track forward button. And let's let's see what it does. I'm all for giving it a try. Again, this was, oh, yeah, look, look at that. What? I mean, right? Doesn't get any easier than that. Okay, so cool. Yeah, and look at that, it beautifully followed. By the way, in the 2020 version, um, and this was actually introduced uh, earlier this year in Premiere, but the masking and tracking engine, it's significantly faster, as you may have noticed. Also, just the accuracy, I mean, it's not like I was zeroing in on a particular object or anything. It's kind of a, a circular mask on part of his face and his nose, and it did a really good job of following it tracking it and keeping that color correction um, as he's moving through the shot, right? I love it when things work. <laughs> All 
All right. Sweet. Yes, we enjoy it, right? I mean, it's super easy. Again, in After Effects, you have you have multiple selectors for really zeroing in on kind of the the, the anchor point of the of the track and, you know, creating that little X pattern to zero in on a particular pixel so that the tracking is just that much tighter. It's just really easy on the Premiere side, okay? All right, well, I think that is it, my friends. So thank you so much for joining. Again, you'll be able to watch the replays on Behance, on my YouTube channel, as well as on Twitter Periscope. So thank you ever so much. I'll be back tomorrow uh, on the Premiere Pro Facebook page, hopefully, we'll see how it goes, as well as YouTube, Behance, and Twitter Periscope. And tomorrow is a special day for me because not only is it Friday the 13th, <laughs> which I love, but tomorrow is also the official release on Spotify, Google Play, Amazon, Apple Music, and everywhere that music is streamed or sold of my latest single entitled Fear the Q-Tip. So that'll be available at midnight tonight in all parts of the world on, you know, Deezer and uh, Xbox Audio and Rhapsody and Pandora eventually and everything else. So you'll be able to listen to my latest single. Very excited about that. Thank you so much. And Erickson, ah, you're very, very welcome. Thank you. Wesley Jones, thank you so much. So yes, so I will see you back tomorrow, probably around noon Pacific time. We'll be doing a little bit of audio, be playing uh, Fear the Q-Tip, showing you the breakdown of the session if you're so inclined. And I'll be taking additional questions. So The Real Con, thank you so much to everyone watching everywhere in the world. Thank you. Have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And we'll see you again next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.